by this first print him and his enrolls as first principles. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, this idea that Nielsen presents here that any authority that obtains must in society must be rooted in at least some form of hypothetical consent. Okay, I think this is very important. So I want to talk about the relations between consent and authority. So I think this is actually one of Nielsen's most fundamental and crucial points. And according to Nielsen, and basically according to everyone on the left, the political left, hierarchies, that is differences in authority, potentially carry grave risks to freedom and autonomy. Grave risks. Why? Well, if society allows me to boss you around, right, if society kind of allows me to have authority over you or stand higher in the hierarchy than you, what that means, either intrinsically or just as a matter of contingent fact, is that it makes it relatively easy for me to abuse and or exploit you. That's just how it is, right? When you look at history, the more power we've given, for example, men over women, bosses over workers, police over citizens, and so on, the more systematic and the more brutal the abuse and exploitation has been of women, workers, citizens, and so on. Right? And just being in such a vulnerable condition, right, being subject to the, the whims of somebody else via their authority, obviously threatens your freedom and autonomy, right? your ability actually to take advantage of the liberties that you're supposed to have. Right? It actually interferes with and threatens your ability to freely and rationally decide what to do and how to live, as we put autonomy earlier. So how do we prevent these terrible outcomes? Right? So maybe you endorse a view that says there can be no authority, no hierarchies. Right? That would be the kind of an anarchistic solution to the prob these problems having to do with authority and power. Now, Nielsen doesn't go that far. Instead, he just points out that to prevent these terrible outcomes, that we need to ensure that authority is somehow infused with the consent of the governed. Okay, so it's not only that the government needs to have the consent of its uh, subjects or citizens, it's that kind of anybody subject to any kind of authority, right? The authority of not only government officials, but your employer, uh, a chosen caste or class or whatever of people in society. Anybody who's subject to the authority of another needs to be able to consent rationally to their having that authority. Right, that's the way we might allow for some authority um, without facing the threats that it can pose to freedom and autonomy. Now, the, the important point of this little interlude here, or one important point, is that not all consent, in quotes, uh, is the right kind. So, in particular, the kinds of, quote, consent to authority that we're most familiar with are not the right kinds to justify those authorities. So here's what we have in mind. So, for example, think about the way that you consent, in quotes, to your boss having authority over you by getting a particular job, right? Uh, you chose to work there, and you can quit whenever you want. So does that mean, right, since you chose to work there in a clear sense, and the fact you can quit, does that mean that the authority that your boss now has over you while you work there cannot threaten your liberty or autonomy. No, right? Even though you chose to work there, even though you can quit, the authority that your boss wields can, in a very meaningful and serious way, threaten your liberty and autonomy. All right, so uh, I want to talk about Elizabeth Anderson again, the person we mentioned earlier who wrote What is the Point of Equality? She also wrote this big, this actually small book uh, a few years ago called Private Government, where she responds, I think, in really helpful ways to the kind of attempted justifications just considered uh, for the kind of sweeping authorities that employers now have in America, right? The sweeping ways that employers can control their workers' lives, right? One point she makes is that people who kind of 
uh, defend the, the point of view just considered that since you chose to work there and you can quit, there's no real worry about threats to your freedom from your boss. Um, she says, laissez-faire liberals touting the freedom of the free market told workers, choose your Leviathan. Right, so the Leviathan is, it's kind of, I think it's like a whale in the Bible or something, but it's most well known in political philosophy um, as the kind of totalitarian uh, ruler, the absolute ruler that Thomas Hobbes kind of invented and said we should uh, endorse as a society um, in his work back in the 17th century. Uh, and Anderson's use of Leviathan here, the idea is that, look, in our world, you need to get a job. Right, so uh, the fact that you chose to work for one employer instead of another, or that you can quit, doesn't really mean that your freedom or autonomy is not threatened. Because suppose you did quit, well, then you're just going to have to go to work for some other boss who has lots of authority over you. So that there's not really a kind of meaningful alternative um, for for almost anybody uh, in the real world. So the fact that you chose to work at a particular place and could quit that particular job doesn't really mean that you kind of consented to all the ways in which your boss might make your life difficult by exercising their authority. All right, now, in a slightly longer uh, discussion, she addresses this idea that since you're free to enter or exit any given employment relationship, that you're not under threat from, your liberty is not under threat from your boss's authority. And to show why that's not a, not a good argument, she gives an analogy with, uh, an old marriage contract. So here's what she says. She says, freedom of entry and exit from any employment relation is not sufficient to justify the outcome. To see this, consider an analogous case for the law of coverture, which the state had long established as the default marriage contract. Under coverture, a woman, upon marrying her husband, lost all rights to own property and make contracts in her own name. Her husband had the right to confine her movements, confiscate any wages she might earn, beat her, and rape her. Divorce was difficult to obtain. But the marriage contract was valid only if voluntarily accepted by both parties. Yet it was a contract into subjection, entailing the wife's submission to the private government of her husband. Okay, so that's the law of coverture. Now here's, to make that more analogous to the case of the kind of current employment contract, here, Anderson continues. She says, imagine a modification of this patriarchal governance regime, allowing either spouse to divorce at will. Right, so now this, the law of coverture is a little bit modified so that uh, you, you can, in principle, either party can, in principle, quit, you know, quit whenever they want, right? Divorce their spouse whenever they want. So now it's kind of, it's more like contemporary employment contracts. All right. So does that mean that the wife in such contracts is free and that the authority the husband uh, exercises is not a threat to her autonomy? Uh, no, Anderson says. So here's, here's her continuing. She says, women would certainly have sufficient reason to object that their liberties would still not be respected under this modification in that it preserves a patriarchal baseline in which men still hold virtually all the cards. It would allow a lucky few to subject, sub, sorry, escape subjection to their husbands, but that's not enough to justify the patriarchal authority the vast majority of men would retain over their wives. All right, here's the big general point that's so important here. Consent to an option within a set cannot justify the option set itself. Consent to an option within a set cannot justify the option set itself. Right, so the idea in Anderson's uh, example here is that uh, just because a woman quote unquote consents to uh, be married to some particular person and so have all of these rules apply to her, that doesn't mean that she kind of uh, consents to all the terrible patriarchal authority that her husband would still exercise in this regime. Right, this kind of this kind of consent, given her lack of realistic alternative options and so on, uh, it shows that this kind of quote unquote consent that she gives does not justify the kinds of authorities that would be vested in uh, the husband by the law of coverture. All right, but that's a pretty complicated example. Let's look at a much simpler example to show this kind of point. 
right? So suppose that you've been unjustly sentenced to death, okay, and the executioner takes pity on you and gives you a choice, quote unquote, between on the one hand death by hanging and on the other hand death by firing squad, all right? So the executioner says, look, you're going to die. Do you want to die by being shot or by being hung? And then let's suppose that in this terrible circumstance, you, you know, quote unquote, choose death by hanging, right? Given those options, that's the one you choose. Now, the question is, does that mean that you have consented to being hung? Does that mean that like you chose to be hung in a way that makes it so that the being hung is uh, uh, not, not a threat to your freedom and rationality? Well, no. Right? Again, consent to an option within a set cannot justify the option set itself. What you would really choose in this option, what you would rationally choose, is not to be hung or shot. Right? You'd rather be liberated. You'd rather be free. Okay? So uh, not all consent, quote-unquote, is created equal. Right? Again, consent to an option within a bad, that is unchosen, set of options typically does not make your quote-unquote choice free in a way that preserves liberty and autonomy. Okay, now why in the world have we gone on talking about that stuff for so long? Well, what we're trying to do is shed light on this idea of Nielsen's, that any authority that obtains in a just society must be rooted in at least some form of hypothetical consent. Right, so for Nielsen, I think what we've learned is that the consent that could potentially justify authority or hierarchy is not the kind of consent just discussed, right? That is kind of consent between bad or unchosen options, like in the law of coverture, uh, contemporary employment contracts, uh, the two, two different ways of being, you know, killed. It's not that kind of consent that could just justify authority or hierarchy but rather it would be the consent to a choice among all possible options, or maybe the consent you might exercise from something like Rawls' original position. It's consent in those conditions that might justify differences in authority, even in a just society.